Hello again. We are back. I hope you enjoyed the, the hospitality that you provided, and I hope you're enjoying the program today as we work through a myriad of different topics. So now we move across to the states and territories. A few notes about this one. Uh, Trish Blake is unable to join us, so we are joined by Penny Lipscomb. Lips, Lipscomb sorry. Welcome, Penny. It's great to have you here. And due to an unexpected parliamentary conflict, our colleagues from New South Wales are not able to join us this afternoon. Now, it is my pleasure to hand over to Tim Liu, who is going to chair this session, and our panellists will be brought up to the stage. Please remember that we encourage questions. We've got a few already for this panel session for states and territories using Slido. So I encourage you, if you haven't already registered to use Slido, please do so. Again, please register and subscribe to receive our monthly e-newsletter, The Charitable Purpose, with the latest news and developments from the ACNC. So we'll put that back in the chat shortly. We've also got our socials, which are continuing to operate and covering today. So please participate in what's happening there. Hashtag Regulators Day 2024. I think we are all here. So I will hand over to you, Tim. Thanks, Mel. Good afternoon, everyone. As the commissioner mentioned in her opening address, charities have multiple regulators at the Commonwealth, state and territory level. The 10th edition of our annual charity support shows that 38% of charities are incorporated associations that are also regulated by state and territory fair trading regulators. We also know that many thousands of charities fundraise across multiple jurisdictions. To give us a regulatory update from Tassie, I'd like to introduce Brad Wheeler, who's the Executive Director at Consumer Building and Occupational Services. Over to you, Brad. So, uh, look, hi, everyone. I don't know how many people here are in the audience are from Tasmania. Um, look, thank you to the ANC, ACNC for organising this event. Uh, and I'm here to speak on as, my, as a representative of the Tasmanian Commissioner for Corporate Affairs. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge and thank all key partners, stakeholders and sector representatives, professionals present today. Uh, as, as, as explained, my name is Brad Wheeler. Uh, and since uh, very late last year, around November, I've been the Executive Director of Consumer Building and Occupational Services in Tasmania, which is amongst other things, responsible for regulating the Tasmanian charity sector. So uh, we have a range of responsibilities and I thought I'd just give a little bit about CBOS because I suspect our environment's a little bit different from some other states. Uh, we're Tasmania's regulator for consumer protection, building standards and occupational licensing. Um, we administer 43 acts and 26 regulations and a whole lot of subordinate rules as well. Uh, approximately a third of the Department of Justice's ministerials come through us. Um, we provide bond administration services for residential tenants Owners and, owners and property managers, licenses uh, for businesses and occupations, building services, electrical plumbing, gas fitting, security and investigation agents. I could go on and on, but you get a bit of a flavour. So, so uh, we don't just deal with corporate affairs. We are actually, my role would normally have six statutory roles, so positions. Uh, so the current state of the charity sector in Tasmania, uh, it plays a crucial role down here, clearly. It contributes to a wide range of areas in the community, including environmental conservation, education, social services, healthcare, cancer support, youth development, religious activities, and support for the disadvantaged in our community. According to the recent data from the AECNC, there are over 1,100 charities based in Tasmania. And the total revenue raised by that sector in 2022 was 3.4 billion, with 103 million of this coming from donations and requests. The charity sector in Tasmania employs over 29,000 people with an additional 52,000 volunteers. To put that in context, it's uh, so about five, a bit over 5% of our population are directly employed and another over 9% uh, contribute through voluntary time and effort. Uh, given this significant revenue, staffing and voluntary figures, our laws need to be fit for purpose. 
as we seek to reduce the regulatory impost on charities seeking to fundraise in Tasmania. Uh, in terms of current topics, as you know, probably doubt, know, uh, the rollout of self-assessing income tax exempt forms from the ATO has commenced. Uh, the aim of the project is to enable not-for-profit organisations to assess whether they are entitled to be exempt from paying tax on revenues. Additionally, Tasmania recently conducted a campaign to encourage associations to use online platforms to complete their transactions and interactions with, with us, including submitting annual returns, applying for incorporation and changing office bearers. Uh, legislative reform. I, I hope I'm not going too fast. I'm not the world's best public speaker, so bear with me. Uh, in terms of legislative reform, in September of last year, um, the Charities and Associations Law Miscellaneous Amendment Bill 2023 was introduced in the Tasmanian Parliament. Unfortunately, um, the, the, uh, we, were, we had an election in the early year and that, that bill failed to pass the House Assembly before that um, and has therefore lapsed. The bill was aimed to amend the Collections for Charities Act 2001 and the Association and Corporation Act of 1964 to implement the 16 national fund fundraising principles. Uh, it's my understanding that a, an updated bill uh, will hopefully be retabled in Parliament this year, so later this year. So we're hoping to get that back up on the agenda. Uh, it's our expectation that the bill will harmonise the cha charity sector, aligning Tasmania with national reforms registration reforms in particular, and reducing the regulatory burden on charities, particularly those operating and reporting across jurisdictions. Uh, importantly, enforcement powers will be strengthened to enhance public confidence in the charitable fundraising sector and afford regulators an ability to act in response to unlawful conduct. Guidance, we will provide guidance to charities by updating the website and inform the charity sector on the amendments of the Act and how the amendments will operate and promoting the changes on social media. Following, fun, fun, uh, sorry, following the finalisation of Charitable Fundraising National Working Group, I understand there was an agreement to accept a set of nationally consistent fundraising principles to streamline and harmonise state and territory requirements on charitable fundraising conduct. Uh, the principles delivered by that working group give charities and donors a clear understanding of appropriate conduct while allowing a greater flexibility as, as to how charities achieve compliance. In Tasmania, the, the implementation of the national fundraising principles will occur after the amendments to the Act have been passed. So we need that Act to go through first. Um, there aren't any uh, anticipated barriers to the harmonisation at this time. And this office, other regulation, the ACNC, have been formally discussed. I understand how you know, harmonisation will occur. My understanding is some of the state regulators have already begun implementing changes relating to charities and registration of the ACNC. So we're probably a little bit behind some others in that regard, but as, as our act gets passed, we'll catch up. Uh, current fundraising requirements will operate together with the NFP, NFP where we're compatible, and we'll continue to have discussions between regulators on mutual recognition and harmonisation in this area. Uh, currently, we have limited enforcement powers in Tasmania available to, to in relation to charities. Uh, it's envisaged amendments through the upcoming bill may provide powers for authorised officers to ensure to, to issue, sorry, serve infringement notices uh, if an offence has been committed. Infringement notices should also be able to be more effective response to unlawful, or unlawful conduct generally. Currently, the auditing threshold in Tasmania is a quarter of a million dollars for incorporated associations, whereas the national reporting threshold, uh, in my understanding, is it's about half a million for small organisations. Um, and to, so to reduce the regulatory burden on in incorporated associations, we hope to align with that. The Tasmanian government has been promoting training and education for charitable organisations, and this approach will most likely form part of any future changes to legislation. So the charity, charity um, sector are well aware of what changes have been put in place, particularly um, given we have a government which is uh, has a number of parties and, and that, that bill may be subject to change on the floor potentially or, or amendments being made. Uh, the final thing I was going to add is that in uh, in Tasmania, there is one difference which um, section eight of the Collection for Charities Act states that an organisation uh, must not permit a child under the age of 16 to solicit under except under certain uh, circumstances, including, you know, uh, accompaniment by an adult. And my understanding is that um, these protections are are above some other jurisdictions, but will be, it is our aim to maintain our more uh, stringent protections in that area. 
that's all I really have as an update. I'm, I'm sorry if that was a bit fast. Um, I'm hoping it wasn't. I, and I'll be really honest, I'm not going to be able to answer detailed questions, but I'm assuming there's a forum here where questions can be submitted and I'm more than happy to get them and get them answered at, at another way if need be. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so we'll have some questions at the end, uh, but if you can't answer it, we can take them offline and answer them after the fact. Um, so thank you for speaking. Next up is Rochelle Turk. Uh, community Industry and Trader Licensing from the ACT. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, look, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Rochelle, and I'm the Director of the Community Industry Trader and Licensing Team within Access Canberra and the ACT. Uh, Access Canberra serves the ACT community through the delivery of regulatory and government services and functions. Uh, we actively engage with community, business, interstate counterparts and key stakeholders to drive outcomes, uh, positive outcomes as community safety, voluntary compliance and behaviours to achieve these positive regulatory outcomes. Uh, within my team, we're sponsoring, uh, responsible for administering a large number um, of pieces of legislation um, on behalf of statutory office holders such as the Register General um, and the Commissioner of Fair Trading, which includes but is not limited to charitable licensing, incorporated associations, security and agents, just to name a few. Um, in the ACT, charitable fundraising is regulated under the Charitable Collections Act 2003 and the Charitable Collections Regulations 2003. These laws place certain requirements on charities that fundraise. Um, charities that fundraise are required to either hold a license or be registered with the ACNC. If the charity is registered with the ACNC, they deem to hold a license in the ACT. Most charities that fundraise in the ACT are registered with the ACNC. The past 12 months has seen significant efforts, uh, efforts to, towards legislative changes across a range of services that we provide. Um, however, mostly, most relevantly in this space is the fundraising principles. Uh, recently, the Council of um, Federal Financial Relations agreed to a set of national fundraising, fundraising conduct principles. These principles informed by national stakeholder consultation aim to harmonise fundraising conduct requirements across all Australian jurisdictions. Charities are required to comply with, for example, rules about when a fundraiser can solicit donations, what donations, uh, sorry, what disclosures must be made to potential donors and what ident identification a fundraiser must display. Uh, for the ACT, these principles came into effect on the 16th of July, 2024, so only very recently. Um, at the time, the ACT re um, repealed existing provisions which overlap the principles. This will give charities and donors a clear understanding of appropriate conduct while allowing charities flexibility in how they achieve compliance. The ACT has retained the ability to impose specific conditions and licences to protect children participating in fundraising um, to the extent that these are not covered by the principles. Children are a vulnerable cohort and as such may need additional protection. If a charity fundraiser, uh, sorry, if, cha if a ch charity breaches the fundraising obligations under ACT, the government can bring civil penalty proceedings. The government also has the ability to cancel licences or to attach conditions to licences if a charity breaches their fundraising obligations. In implementing the nationally consistent principles, the ACT aim to make the principles legally binding on all charities that conduct fundraising in the ACT, create an enforcement mechanism so that the regulatory action could be taken if needed to enforce these principles, and remove existing obligations that um, under ACT that overlap with the principles, noting that they would be outdated and duplicate, duplicative once the principles are in force. As the principles were only recently in, introduced, we don't have any observations at this stage. However, we look forward to next year's regulator day when we'll be able to do so. Thank you everyone for your time. Um, and yeah, I understand there's a Q&A later. So um, I look forward to addressing any questions then. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, next up, I'm going to award Penny the gold medal for flexibility, given that she's had less than 24 hours notice to speak. Uh, but it's Penny Lipscomb, Director of Legal and Policy at Consumer Protection WA. Over to you, Penny. 
Thank you very much, Tim, and hello, everyone. Uh, look, a key focus for WA this year has been uh, to get our Charitable Collections Amendment Bill up and into Parliament. Uh, it will do two things to help align uh, WA with uh, most of the rest of you uh, and to create greater consistency and less duplications for charities operating nationally and across WA. Uh, the first thing the bill will do is implement the National Mutual Recognition Scheme. And this will allow charities registered with the ACNC to be taken to hold a license under our Charitable Collections Act. Uh, this will be subject to a simple notification process to consumer protection. Uh, so like how most other states and territories currently operate, once a charity is registered with the ACNC and has notified us that they are registered and, and intend to undertake collections here in WA, they'll be deemed to hold a WA licence. Uh, and uh, all charities operating in WA will then be subject to the conditions under the Charitable Collections Act. The second change uh, will be to allow the nationally agreed conduct principles to be applied to all WA charity licenses uh, as a condition of license. Uh, WA currently has limited prescriptive conduct requirements within our legislation. Uh, these relate to calling hours and identification badge requirements, but we also have a voluntary code of practice uh, that charity license holders can agree to adopt or not. And these are very similar to um, the national principles. But on commencement of the amendments, the new national principles will replace those prescribed uh, conduct principles and the voluntary code of practice. Uh, and this will make conduct obligations consistent, but more importantly, they'll become enforceable. Uh, the drafting of our bill is near completion and we're hopeful that it'll be introduced uh, before the end of this calendar year. However, uh, WA will be heading into an election in March of next year, so there is a chance that the bill will not pass this year. That being the case, though, we will seek to reintroduce it once the new government is established. Uh, and then uh, we will endeavour to get all the changes uh, uh, into effect as soon as possible during 2025. Um, I just, unlike the rest of you, I'd like to offer a couple of comments about things that we've uh, noted during the process of developing the principles. Um, one is that uh, the process that was set up of a national working group to work through those principles we thought was very effective and one of the other things that we're anticipating is that there will be a need for guidance for charities with the new processes coming in uh, and it would be very useful if that guidance could be developed consistently uh, amongst us all so we're thinking that it would be really good to uh, create another national working group to look to develop some consistent guidance material. Uh, the other thing that we think would be useful is to create a, a permanent national charities regulators forum, uh, such as this one, uh, just to improve overall regulatory infrastructure uh, and architecture and the ability to uh, talk through issues as they arrive nationally. Thank you, Penny. Uh, both sound like great ideas and I'm sure the sector would support a single set of guidance principles uh, when implementing the national fundraising principles. Um, I'll now turn to Craig Turner, the Executive Director of the Office of Fair Trading in Queensland. Craig? Yeah, thanks very much for that. You saved me having to tell you who my name is and what I do. Um, but not unlike just about everyone else on the call, um, you know, the Office of Fair Trade in Queensland got a pretty broad remit in terms of what we do. A lot of um, heavily regulated industries like, uh, like um, security, uh, real estate agents, motor dealers, that sort of thing. 
but also a very heavy uh, lean towards things like the Australian Consumer Law. Um, we regulate charities and associations in corporations, so we, you know, like everyone else here, offer a, a, a low cost, low obligation form of incorporation. Um, our Charities Act is from 1966, I think, and and some older pieces of legislation relating to other forms of um, incorporation, which had only recently been repealed, had an 18 in front of it. So it's pretty old. Um, but going down the uh, the path of um, the harmonisation path, I can just give you a very quick uh, roadmap of where we've been and where we're going to. Um, from the 1st of July 2022, um, we, uh, we uh, adopted the harmonised reporting uh, arrangements, basically exempting ACNC um, uh, organisations from having to report twice. So if you registered with the ACNC, that's all you had to report to. This has helped, I think, over 70% of our charities. Uh, on the 1st of May 2023, we implemented the cross-border recognition of ACNC registration, uh, which is basically a, a rubber stamp registration um, upon request. Um, on the 1st of July 2023, um, uh, we reduced, not specifically related to uh, charities, but a lot of charities are also incorporated associations. So we reduced thresholds in terms of reporting and um, auditing of those um, entities. And from the uh, 1st of July this year, uh, we've implemented the change to try and cut out, um, I'm sure if anyone's ever had anything to do with um, incorporated associations that are like, there's a lot of infighting. So we've set up some model rules for grievance procedures, which everyone has to adopt. Uh, you can also um, make it a bespoke um, uh, version of the grievance procedures, but they have to be approved by the Office of Fair Trading. So in the vicinity of 30,000 incorporated associations, we're hopeful that that will not only help them in their role, but also help us in, in focusing on some uh, fairly important issues. In terms of the national fundraising principles, they're in the process of being adopted. Um, in November last year, we published more or less a, a, an implementation plan of when those things were going through. We think it's, uh, or we're quite clear that it can go through in subordinate legislation in Queensland. Um, we're just settling the changes with um, Parliamentary Council, uh, I think is fair to say at the moment. Problem for us, I guess, is, um, and I'm hearing it across the states, is that we're going into caretaker in maybe five weeks. So um, we have to keep that in mind. Um, the principles will pretty much replace the fundraising requirements across the board in, in Queensland. In terms of operation and the way we approach these type of matters, um, there's probably five and a half thousand charities in Queensland. Um, I, I can say that we publish our proactive program each year. Uh, the, the review of charities isn't part of our proactive program. The, the data um, doesn't suggest it should be, so we adopt a, a reactive approach to that. But in our published regulatory priorities, we um, we propose to take a, a strong stance as a, as a priority on unlicensed and unauthorised activities, be that um, unlicensed motor dealers, unlicensed real estate agents, but also unsanctioned charities. It is not a common occurrence in Queensland, but given that we uh, are subject to significant changes in climate and therefore flooding and other sort of natural disasters, I'm sure the same happens everywhere else, but these sort of unauthorised activities tend to pop up post uh, disaster. Uh, and we have to keep an eye out on those. Now, we take a fairly common sense approach when we're dealing with them. Um, but if we find somebody who's um, who's really taking advantage, we have some limited but effective uh, ways of getting through on that. Um, by way of example, in the last floods in Brisbane in 2022, subsequent to that, later in 2022 and early 2023, we ended up prosecuting three individuals who ran an unsanctioned charity um, because they couldn't account to us and show that they were bona fide in their, the way they were doing things, we then froze uh, their personal accounts of all three people. We then uh, used our, our powers under the, um, uh, the Charities Act to vest those monies in the public trustee and then subsequent to that uh, issued a direction to the public trustee to vest those monies 
into charities that we knew were uh, genuine. So that's kind of a bit of a wrap up for us where we are on the journey to the national consistency, but also a very quick overview of the way we proactively assess these things, but um, at what powers we have in a reactive sense as well. So happy to take any questions later on. Thanks a lot for that, Craig. Uh, next, we have Nicole Rich, the Executive Director of Regu Regulatory Services at Consumer Affairs Victoria. Welcome. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I'm the Director of Consumer Affairs Victoria, so nice to meet everybody. Um, hello and greetings from very warm and sunny Melbourne and just acknowledging that I come to you from Wurundjeri Woiwurrung lands today and acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that um, I'm meeting you from today and pay my respects to them and to their elders past and present as well. Thank you for the opportunity um, to give you a bit of an update about what's happening in Victoria and I, I mean I guess somewhat like uh, some of the other jurisdictions we're going down the path of implementing um, those national reforms and we're some way down the track now, I'm pleased to say. So I think it'd be interesting for people to know, uh, in Victoria, we've um, had those arrangements in place for a number of years now, where uh, we uh, effectively have deemed fundraising registration for charities registered with the ACNC. And I think that was a really important reform to streamline uh, regulatory requirements for charities. You'd probably be interested to know that the number of registered fundraisers that we have in Victoria is actually continuing to grow. We saw 3,000 new registered fundraisers um, so far this year, which is an 8% increase on last year. So it is quite a lot of growth, but almost 90% of these are deemed fundraisers and registered charities. So the growth is largely in charities that are you know, already registered with the ACNC um, and, and doing good work and already uh, complying with those regulations. So it's become a really important part of the Victorian scheme as well. And as of July, um, Chari registered charities are also governed by the national fundraising principles in Victoria, which I'll come back to. So this year we've really focused on progressing those reforms. Um, we're really committed to providing a clear and consistent regulatory framework for charities who are conducting fundraising here in our state through those principles. And I, I guess our vision by next year would be that all charitable fundraisers, you know, have a really good understanding of what they are required to do and, and why. Um, and uh, again, I'll come back to this, but Consumer Affairs Victoria is certainly um, going to continue to work together with our counterparts um, in the other jurisdictions around streamlining obligations and trying to provide consistent guidance while also taking quite seriously the need to enforce those requirements where, where necessary to protect the community um, from harm from poor fundraising practices where that can occur. Uh, so in March this year, we released our three-year plan to implement the national fundraising principles. So that is now available on our website and it sets out some immediate steps that we are following to introduce the principles as well as some longer term aims for, for us to develop that consistent guidance and work with stakeholders and, and other jurisdictions. And in July, our reg fundraising regulations were amended. So as of about a month ago, um, registered charities here are now exempt from specified conduct requirements that uh, otherwise exist under the Victorian legislation. So instead, charities are required to comply with the fundraising principles in Victoria now um, to maintain your deemed registration in Victoria. But what that means is that charities are now exempt from a range of uh, quite prescriptive requirements that otherwise would apply in Victoria, including everything from identification badges to receptacles for collecting money, um, the way in which you're supposed to disclose the amount of money you're going to use for the beneficial purposes versus for administration. So these we know have been really big pain points um, for fundraising and, and charities for a long time. And I think people would probably be pleased to understand that um, the principles are now in force in Victoria. And if you're complying with those, then you don't need to comply with those prescriptive standards anymore. So I guess where we're, where we're at now is considering any further regulatory tools that uh, we think are or should be available and appropriate to monitor 
and enforce compliance with the principles. And yeah, we do look forward to collaborating further with colleagues. And I think Penny, your um, some of your suggestions are, are really good ones there so that we can be providing that consistent guidance and approach. And um, just to finish, also from the 1st of July this year, we took some further steps uh, to streamline regulatory requirements for incorporated associations. So um, I think Mel mentioned at the introduction that of course, many of you will be incorporated associations in your relevant home state or territory as well. And we, we understand that. So um, we've also streamlined those requirements for incorporated associations now. And essentially we've just aligned the financial reporting thresholds um, and tiers with the ACNC's thresholds for small, medium and large charities. And we just hope that that means that it makes it a lot easier for associations in Victoria. You can just prepare a single set of financial reports and those will satisfy the requirements under both schemes now. So I think that will be freeing up time and funds, which of course you need to use for your beneficial and charitable purposes. Um, so again, I think a really positive reform. Uh, I'll finish my opening remarks there, but like others, really happy to discuss further or answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, um, Amanda Nobbs, sorry, Kuro was next on the list, but unfortunately she's had some IT issues. So um, unfortunately she won't be able to speak today. Um, so that means last but not least is Martin Campbell, who is the newly appointed Commissioner of Consumer and Business Services. Um, he started in June 2024. So welcome, congratulations, and over to you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, yes, it's so a week five for me in the job, and um, I've been around regulators a long time, but regulating charities is very new to me. So um, I just want to start by thanking um, my team who manage this area. It's a very small team, but they're very talented and extremely busy. They are helping 22,000 incorporated associations in South Australia, and 4,000 of those associations are ACNC members. So um, I thought I'd give you a bit of a snapshot from a regulatory approach, what we've been doing here. Um, as others, um, my department uh, regulates about 45 bits of legislation. Not that it's a competition, Brad, but we win. Anyway, that's my competitive streak out of the way. Um, so in South Australia, we were the first state to introduce the national fundraising principles, which came in on the 29th of January. Um, again, it's not a competition, but South Australia was first, just saying. Um, so those fundraising principles uh, are now incorporated into the SA Charities Code of Practice. So it's now a condition of charities in South Australia that they comply with that code of practice and therefore the national fundraising principles. Um, I was listening to the previous session around uh, ATO and tax. Um, so I am very cognizant of some of the challenges that um, the legislation, both Commonwealth and state present to organizations. Therefore, my regulatory position as a new regulator is very much focused around advice, education and support to people to keep them on the right side of compliance so that they can do the right thing. So um, Zoe Thomas, who leads our, our team, um, her and they are working um, tirelessly to make sure that that education, advice and support is available to people. So we have a process where a lot of organisations will come for face to face or online support, advice and guidance that just helps them navigate the Commonwealth and state legislative landscape and helps organisations understand where they fit and what the compliance requirements are. Um, I'm very cognizant to, to make sure that we help people do the right thing. Um, it shouldn't be any surprise to any organisation if regulatory action is taken against them. Um, and fortunately for us, that, that part of the regulatory work is quite small, um, which is where we'd like to keep it. But the the education and, and, and support is, is, is a big part of that. Um, we've also strengthened our financial reporting and uh, taken action to revoke state-based charity licenses when a charity is non-compliant. Um, obviously, that doesn't affect ACNC regis registration, um, but where we have grounds to revoke charity licenses in South Australia for non-compliance, then we do so. Um, 
What other aspects we've got? Um, we're still in the process of working on a memorandum of understanding for data sharing with the ACNC. Uh, I think from any regulatory perspective, um, data sharing is becoming a fundamental keystone aspect of, of working together. Um, we're hoping to progress that in the next few months and then have a much stronger platform to share information between South Australia and the Commonwealth. Um, another aspect uh, is Zoe and her team, or Zoe in particular, um, chairs a, an incorporated associations regulatory forum. So this is a, a group of regulators to tackle issues that are common to all. Uh, um, or to seek some support, advice, guidance around prickly individual problems that present themselves. So I think this is trying to get some national consistency of approach, particularly from regulatory authorities. Um, so it shouldn't be it shouldn't be too different between states. But I do appreciate in a federated system that we're always going to get some differences. But Zoe leads that group, um, and and hopefully we can get some um, alignment around how we operate what we operate and, and some of the work that we do for people. Um, probably just to wrap that up, I suppose for me, it's it, it's more of the same in relation to taking a, an approach around education and support for organisations to keep them on the right side of, of compliance and helping people bridge that knowledge gap where they're not sure of whether they sit um, in relation to what the compliance requirements are, whether it's Commonwealth um, or state. So I might just put a pin in it there and um, and yeah, happy to take any questions. Probably not gonna be able to answer too many, but happy to take them on notice and provide a written answer afterwards. Thanks, Thanks Martin. Um, and I did wanna commend Zoe on that forum. So the ACNC and both, and the ATO um, have been invited to attend that forum as participants. And I think it's a really uh, great idea to talk about issues specifically related to incorporated associations. Um, I'll pass over now to Mel for any questions in the chat. Thanks, Mel. Thank you, Tim. So this is quite a broad one. What is the risk to the community of largely unregulated fundraising internet platforms? And does it keep you awake at night not having enough tools to deal with it? So I think anyone might want to jump in and, and provide their views to start things off. I don't mind Martin, yeah, please. Uh, look, it, it, it does keep me awake um, to a degree, I suppose. Um, I wear a con the fair trading and consumer protection hat as well as corporate affairs and, and a number of other hats. So my worry is that an unregulated environment in this space allows people to steal and defraud money from those people that are probably the most vulnerable in society. Um, and the, but there's a whole range of compliance activities, I mean, uh, compliance issues, but predominantly what jumps out to me is that we want to try and protect people from wrongdoing and from fraud and abuse. Um, but there are also other issues as well in relation to, to tax and tax evasion. So I think from my perspective, it's, regulators need to be receptive to new strategies to tackle ever evolving initiatives. Um, and just because somebody says they're a charity doesn't necessarily mean they are and that they're all they're in it for the right reasons. So I'm very, very focused on making sure we've got framework that supports consumers and, and make sure that people aren't ripped off. Thanks, Martin. Does anyone else want to contribute to that one? Yeah, go for it, Craig. Yeah, I think there's two aspects to that. There's, there's consumers being ripped off, but to be honest, I think that's that's a, a lesser evil than the reputational damage that those sort of things have on the charity sector in, in you know across the board. Um, with people's money getting tighter, um, bad actors in the space really could, in in my opinion, impact the you know the um, the ability of uh traditional and bona fide fundraisers to um to uh to um gain you know keep that trust of the public and you know sometimes if your legislation is pretty old like all of ours is there are certain issues that um you know certain tools that take forever to do um i think 
and 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 I think a lot of um, fair trading regulators are moving this space a little bit, is to be able to start um, thinking a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, responsibly um, in terms of maybe public warnings, that type of thing, rather than the traditional approach. That's certainly something that we're looking at up in Queensland, not necessarily from a charitable space, but if there is harm to both a consumer and an industry, a, a bona fide industry in general, uh, then uh, we just have to think about what other ways we can put or mitigate some of those concerns with immediate effect. That's great. Thank you very much, Craig. Now that brings us to time. I think that's been a really rich discussion. We've covered a lot of ground there from across this broad nation. I do want to add that the Northern Territory have provided a written update. So unfortunately, due to those technology issues, Amanda couldn't participate, but we will make that available uh, to share with participants. I'd like to finish by thanking Tim and all of our panellists today. Thank you very much for your time and participation. It's really, really good to see the cooperation across uh, different levels of government uh, across Australia. So thank you very much for your contribution today.